Meet Nathan. He wants to make a game, even though he's never written a single line of code. He's been at his computer for weeks, trying different things. Like most of us, he started by Googling. How do I make a game? After scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, he ended up in... Like many of us, he probably watched hundreds of tutorials, following along diligently. And at the end of it, he thought he had built something amazing. But realized he doesn't know anything. So he tried to go to the best, but they were on vacation. So he came here instead. I've spent the last two years learning game development and have gone through all of the same sort of stuff. It's easy to fall into a trap of watching tutorials but not actually learning anything. Hopefully this tutorial is different. With the help of Game Maker, used to make Hyperlight Drifter, Hotline Miami, and Undertale, it will give you a foundation to go off and start making your own games. I'm going to cover all of the basics. We'll start with installing the game engine learning the game maker interface, writing your first lines of code, and then building a complete game that looks like this. Let's get started. We are gonna build a clone of that dino game, which you may have seen in Chrome when your internet goes out. Head over to gamemaker.io. GameMaker, game maker is an engine similar to Unity, which you may have heard of, but I think it's actually the best engine for learning. It's got a really shallow learning curve and there's a free tier that you can use to get started. You'll need to make a new account. Game Maker is run by Opera. And then once you have an account, you'll sign in and see your dashboard. In the top right, you'll see a download button where you can download it for either Windows or Mac. I'm working with Windows right now. So I'm going to download that version, run the install process, and then go ahead and boot up Game Maker. So this is the first screen you'll see. You'll see a list of recent projects, which you won't have any, but in the top left, you can hit new. And then we are going to start with a brand new blank GML project. Go ahead, give it a name. I'll call it mine Robo Jump and hit let's go. On the right hand bar, you'll have the asset browser. This is going to contain most of your files for the games. Things like sprites that you make, scripts or code that you write for your game, and a number of other general assets that you'll create. In the center, you'll have the workspace. This lets you dig deeper into your assets. For example, if I open up an object, I see all of these details about that object. We'll get into that more later. On the top, you have the toolbar. There's a lot in there. Most of it we aren't going to use for this tutorial. We're really just going to use the play and stop buttons to run and stop our game. On the bottom, you'll have a bunch of tabs by default. To be honest, also for this tutorial, you won't use most of them. We're really just going to focus in on the output, which I'll get more into later in the tutorial. It's where all of our logs will go. On the left hand, you have the inspector. The inspector is mainly used in the room editor, which we haven't seen yet. So if you double click on your room in your asset browser, which you have by default, opens up the room editor in a new tab. Then on the left hand bar, you'll see that inspector populates some, with some information about the layers. Again, another piece that we'll get into more throughout the tutorial. And that's it. So now I want to clean up a little bit. I really like how Game Maker lets you arrange the interface however you want. So you can close tabs with those little arrows on the side. You can resize them. On the bottom, I'm going to go ahead and close out some of these things that we're not going to use. 
And then anything else, I'm gonna actually drag those tabs from the bottom over to the right pane over there. I think this looks a little bit cleaner. I don't like having that bottom bar. After cleaning that up a little bit, I'm going to reopen the asset browser. And on the bottom right, I can actually scale it up a little bit so I can control how big that is, but that's enough for now. Also over in your asset browser, go ahead and delete all of these empty folders. It's just clutter and it's very confusing when you're a beginner to have all of that information. So let's delete those, but you can leave the default room. We will go ahead and use that. Another little setup piece in the top right, you'll see a button that says GX Games. Click on that, it's gonna open up a little window and you're gonna go over to the left and hit test. This is how your game gets built. We want it to build directly to your computer, which is what test does. Then you can hit the play button in your toolbar and you've run a game. Technically, you just built your first game, even though it's not super exciting yet. Close that out and you'll see in the output tab, which automatically opens up when you run the game, you'll see a bunch of logs. That's what I was talking about earlier. This will be useful down the road. Okay, step number one. We just want to simply draw a player to the screen. In our case, it's gonna be that little dino guy. Right click in the asset browser, hit create, and then you're gonna go down and hit sprite. This is going to open up a window in your workspace with details about that specific sprite. We can give it a name. So in this case, I'm just going to call it something like Robo Sprite. Then I'm going to click those four little arrows. That's going to open up another window and let us resize it. You don't need to be too concerned with the size at the moment. I'm just going to give it 16 by 16 pixels. It's a little bit arbitrary. Then you'll hit Edit Image. It has this sprite editor, which will look very familiar if you've ever used anything like paint. So we'll go ahead and actually make a sprite. Feel free to make your own. I'm gonna draw a little robot guy here. All right, we can go to the top and click back into our workspace tab once we are done. And then we're gonna right click in the asset browser again, hit create, and then go over and select object. This is gonna open up another window in our workspace with details about our object. But what is an object? The simplest way to think about objects are they are used to break your game into smaller pieces. For example, if we look at Mario, we could write Mario all in one giant code script, or we could break it up into pieces, which are easier to understand, like a player object, a shroom object, a pipe object. They also give you some stuff for free. So for example, if we have a player object, that player object has things like physics and events automatically. We want to take advantage of those features. So everything in this game is going to be an object. Players, roads, obstacles. And you'll see some of those details in your workspace object viewer. For example, you'll see uses physics there or an events tab. For now, we'll just go ahead and give this object a name though. I am going to go ahead and just call it player. Objects can have default sprites. So you can drag your sprite that you created over into that sprite box, or you can just click on the input box and select your sprite. I'll do that for now. Select our robo sprite. Then we want to place our player into the room. So double click on your room which will move us back into the room editor. You'll see in the center this big empty workspace. So that is where we are actually going to place things into the room. I find it really helpful to drag 
the inspector tab on the left over to the right hand bar when working in the room. This means that when we select things like, for example, the background layer on the left, it opens up in our inspector tab on the right. And then we can adjust different properties on it. Say we don't want the background to be black. We want it to be a very dark blue color. So we could adjust that here. But back to our player, open up the asset browser again and just drag the player object into the room. You'll see it appears very small. You can zoom in with the magnifying glass at the top and then you can grab the corner of that and just drag it and make it much bigger. By default, the size and dimensions of this room are going to be identical with the game window when we start it. So just make it proportionate to the size of the room. Once you've got that set up, you can either hit F5 or hit the play button again and run your game. And you will see your little player hanging out in the room. Not doing anything yet. So we need a road for this guy to run along. So back in the asset browser, we are going to create another sprite the same way you did before. Right click, create sprite, and then head back into our workspace. And we are going to call this one something like road sprite. We are going to use this object to drop into the room and it's going to look just like the road on the bottom of that game. Let's set up the dimensions again. So hit those arrows. This time we are going to make it the same height as the player, so 16. But I'm gonna make the width a little bit bigger so that we can have wider chunks of road compared to the player. Apply those changes and then head back into edit image. And we're gonna do the same thing again and draw ourselves a sprite. Don't worry, it doesn't need to be too fancy. Just have fun with it. Once we're done with that, we are again going to create an object now. So right click in the asset browser, create object. And we are going to call this one road. And then we're going to drag and drop our sprite into the road object. And once again, click back into the room, drag and drop our road into the room. We can adjust where our player is at. We can adjust the size of our road a bit. I'm going to make it big enough so that it looks proportionate to the player. And I also want to have about three of these to take up the entire width of the game. So that looks about good for the first one. I'm going to set that up against the left side. Then I can click on the road and do control C and control V to copy and paste the road. Then I can position that second piece of road right against the first and then paste once again because we're actually going to want a third piece that purposefully overflows out of the right side. We want this because the road is going to be moving. So we'll need the road to be a little bit longer than the actual room. That looks good. Let's run the game. Make sure it looks good there. Yep, looks exactly as I would expect. And now we can head over to our road object and start thinking about what we need to make the road move. This is going to involve events. If you click add event, you'll see a bunch of different default events. Things like create, destroy, step, etc. 
We aren't going to use too many of these, just a few throughout the tutorial, but feel free to explore around. Before we actually create our first event, let's go ahead and talk about what even are events, how do they work? So every object in the game can have event handlers. This means you can attach a piece of code to an event and that code runs when that event fires. So when this player, for example, gets created, we can run some piece of code. We're gonna be dealing with the step event though. The way games work is there's a loop and they're constantly running and displaying different frames of the game, like a stop motion video almost. Game Maker calls each one of these frames steps. So the step event is gonna run very quickly. It's gonna run ideally about 60 frames per second, which means it's great for things like input or anything that runs very quickly or needs to be checked often. So let's go ahead for our road event, add in that step event. You'll just click on step and it's gonna open up a code editor and we'll start looking at writing our very first piece of code. We're using this event so we can tell the road to shift to the left a little bit every frame. Now I know a lot of you have never written any code before, so let's start with something really, really simple. So let's start with just a comment. If you start a line with slash slash, it is a comment that's going to be completely ignored. So even if the script runs, nothing is going to happen with these comment lines. I find them really useful in the beginning for just explaining what I'm about to do or making notes about my code that will be helpful to me later on. For example, we could explain a little bit about what's happening in this step event. Now to actually move the player, we have to come back to this object idea. So every object in the game has some coordinate associated with it, an X, Y coordinate. So we have access to those two properties or variables where we can manipulate them in code. So for example, this is gonna look just like a mathematical expression. We can say x equals x minus one, which is gonna subtract one pixel from the x coordinate. Run the game and you'll actually see that running. Congratulations, you just wrote your very first line of code, hopefully. Now there are a couple of problems with this. One, it's moving very slowly. So let's adjust that. Instead of moving one pixel per frame, I'm going to bump that up and move it four per frame. There we go. Looking good. And our second problem is that it obviously ends. The road ends. Here's what we want to happen. As the road pieces shift to the left each frame, when the road piece all the way to the left goes too far, we want it to move over to the right. And then... The rest of the pieces can just continue on as they were. Once another one goes off screen, it will shift again. So we already talked there's an XY property on objects. There are also sprite width and sprite height properties that will be helpful to us. This will help us find the right side of the road because the XY coordinate is on the left side, if that makes sense. So I'm going to go through this code a little bit quickly and we will loop back and explain everything afterwards. So I'm going to use something called an if statement, which checks an expression inside of these two parentheses. Our expression is going to be if x plus the sprite width, meaning the right side of the road, is less than zero, which is the left edge of our room, then we want to do something inside of these two curly braces. What we want to do is exactly what we just explained. We want to shift that piece of road that has gone off the screen over to the right side. So I'm gonna create a variable called last road, grab the furthest piece of road, which is gonna be the road piece all the way to the right, 
and then I'm going to assign the left side of the road piece that went off of the room, butt it up against the right side of the road piece all the way to the right. So again, it's just doing that process of shifting that left piece of road over to that right piece. Now, again, I know this is not going to be extremely clear what's going on. Let's go ahead and run the game and make sure that it looks okay. And then we will jump in and explain that code line by line. Looks good. Working as expected. Now into the code. The first important thing to understand is that code runs line by line. So the order does matter. If I do something in line one, like create a variable, I will be able to reference it further down, but not vice versa. Let's start with the very first line here, x equals x minus one. This is an assignment expression where we can assign a value or an expression. For example, assign the x coordinate of our piece of road to a different value, shift it to the left. Then we have a blank line, which is going to get ignored. And then that if statement, if statements are formatted like this, if some expression, then run code inside of those braces. So again, we're dealing with this X plus sprite width is less than zero, which checks when our road goes off the left side of the screen. When that is true, it's going to run what's inside of those curly braces, which is another assignment expression, except with the word var this time var is a local variable. It's just stored temporarily for this script and not associated directly to our object, like x is, for example. What is being assigned to the variable last road is the result of a function call. A function call has some name of a function, takes in some input, and then returns some output. You'll see this over and over in code function we are using is instance furthest, which takes an xy coordinate and an object. Then it finds the instance of that object that is furthest away from that coordinate. So in this case, the road that is furthest away from this road, the road where this code is running. Once we have that last road variable, then we can do something with it. So in the next line, we are going to assign the X value of the piece of road that has gone off the screen to the X value of the last piece of road plus its sprite width. Again, butting up the left side of the piece of road off screen up against the right side of that last piece of road just like that. This dot syntax is just a way to access a property of an object. So last row dot x, the x property of that specific piece of road. And then the last end brace, which again is just going to get ignored in this case. I know this stuff isn't easy. One of the hardest parts of programming is just understanding the flow of data. I would really try to just focus in on inputs and outputs, meaning what data do I have and how does it change line by line throughout the program? All right, let's add some obstacles. At this point, you actually have all the basics that you need, all of the core concepts. At this point, I'm really just going to be using some functions that you've never seen before, but you understand how functions work in general. If you need to see details on a specific function, hover your mouse over it and it will have this little pop-up. Then you can actually click on it and hit F1, which is gonna pop up another little window where you can click use online manual. This will give you again, all of the details about that specific function, inputs, outputs, any special scenarios, and then usually some examples of how to use it. It's really, really helpful. Back in our code, we are going to make another sprite now. So going to go ahead and do the normal thing for sprites. Give the sprite a name. We're going to go over, set the dimensions for that sprite, which in this case, I'm going to make the same size as the player. 
16 by 16. And then we will go back and hit edit image. And once again, draw a sprite. In this case, I'm just gonna draw kind of a goofy looking tree. You can draw a cactus like the original game or again, whatever you want, get creative. Once you're done, again, create an object. We need an object, We're gonna call it tree. We're gonna assign our tree sprite to our tree object. Now, instead of actually dropping our tree in the room, we're gonna create another object called spawn point. So we don't wanna manually drag a tree into the room because then only one tree will show up. We want to automatically spawn multiple trees into the room whenever we want. So if we take this spawn point object, which remember every object has an X, Y coordinate associated with it, if I drag and drop that into the room, I can then grab that object from code somewhere and dump trees into the XY coordinate of that spawn point. If we ever want to move or change where our trees get spawned, we just move around the spawn point. Now, we need some piece of code to be responsible for putting the trees in. So I'm going to make another object for that and call it spawner. I will drag spawner somewhere into the room, but it's not going to have any visuals, so it doesn't matter where. I usually put stuff like this at zero, zero, just the top left of the room. And then we can use events on the spawner to kick off the code to spawn trees. I'm going to use two events for this. I'm going to use a create event and something called an alarm, which you have not seen before. Alarms are really simple. The whole idea of an alarm is that you can assign a timer to a specific alarm number, and when that timer runs out, the alarm will fire. The syntax looks like this. Alarm, square brackets, zero is which alarm, so alarm zero, and 30 is how many frames before it fires. So if we go to our alarm zero event, this is gonna be the code that runs after 30 frames reaches zero. So the game starts, 30 frames run, and then this alarm gets fired. To start, we'll go ahead and find the spawn point. So again, this is stuff you've seen. Var spawn point as a variable, local variable. We're gonna sign the result of the instance find function, which you have not seen before. But it takes the input of the object it wants to find, which iteration of that object, which we just want to find the first, so we're passing in zero, and then it's going to return back that object. Once we have the spawn point, then we can actually create an instance of that tree object. I'm going to use instance create depth, which takes in an x, y coordinate, which we'll grab from the spawn point, a depth, which is always zero for our 2D game, and then the tree object. Once we spawn that in, then we have to reset the alarm. So we'll set that back to 30. So then another 30 frames will go by and the alarm will fire again. So that alarm will end up just firing in a loop every 30 frames. Over in the tree, I'm going to add a step event. We want the tree to move exactly as the road does. So we can use that same line of code x equals x minus 4. And similarly as the road, if it goes too far off the left side of the screen, then I want to destroy it. So we'll have the trees just disappear when they go not exactly at zero, but I'll use negative 100. And we've got our first little weird bug here. So the trees are underneath the road instead of being on top of it. If you pull up the tree sprite, you'll see like a little crosshairs in the top left. That's called the anchor point. We can drag that. That's actually where the XY is going to live on the sprite. So we'll drag it down to the base instead of it being in the top left. Run the game again, hit F5, and you'll see that fixed the bug. It, they are all spawning on top of the road now. We don't want 
all the trees to spawn that closely together though. So go back over to the spawner object and in alarms, instead of using 30 frames, let's use 120. So roughly every two seconds, a new tree will spawn in. So run the game and you'll see that. So instead of them being consistent, what we can also do is use this random range function takes in two numbers and picks a random number between those two numbers. So if we use something like 60 and 240, then trees will spawn, you know, between every second and every three or four seconds. So not the most challenging game in the world, but give it a little bit more variety than just consistently spawning at the exact same time. So, the next problem here is that our player runs into those trees, but nothing happens. So looking back at the original game, when a tree or a cactus hits the player, the game is over. They lose. So let's add a step event to our player, and we're going to use a function called place meeting. So that takes in, again, an x, y coordinate and an object. And it's going to check if that position collides with that object or an instance of that object. So there's going to be a bunch of trees, a bunch of different instances of those trees. Then we'll call game end. So if we run the game, you'll see what happens. So let a tree spawn up, wait for that player to hit it, and then the window shuts down. And finally, we need to let the player jump over these trees. I'm going to adjust the anchor point on our player sprite as well. I know that is going to be important. And I'm going to pull up the player object in our workspace and mark use physics. This will let us apply gravity to the player. So let's run it and you'll see does nothing. So that is because by default, the gravity on this player is set to zero. So let's add a create event. That's where we can adjust the gravity property. We can say gravity equals 0 0.27. That will apply a downward force on the object. So that happened a little fast. Go into the room. Let's just drag the player up for testing. Run the game again, and you'll see there he goes. Slowly gets that gravity force applied to him over time. Now he's obviously not landing on the road. He's just falling into the abyss. So... Let's handle how to do that. So we could check for a collision with the road. I'm going to handle this slightly differently. So I'm going to add an end step event, which is exactly like step. It just fires right after step. So step fires once per frame, and then end step also fires once per frame, but slightly after step. Here, I'm just going to clamp the Y value using the min function. This is going to take whatever value is smaller between the player's current y position and the ground. So if he falls too far down, it's going to clamp him up to the ground and just constantly do that every frame. This way I don't need to worry about extra collisions between the road and the player. Now we don't actually have a variable called ground. So if we go to create, we can add what's called an instance variable. I've been calling them properties. I'll add one called ground. So ground equals instance find, and I will find an instance of the road. Doesn't matter which one, there'll be multiple. And then I'll just take the Y value from that road object directly. And that kind of works. There's something off with the padding of the sprites or where their anchor points are. This is not the cleanest solution, but I'm just going to add a buffer and subtract off about 80 pixels. That's what it looks to be off by. And then that will set our player down onto the road. So you'll see when you start up the game, he falls and then he lands there and he sticks there. So our next step is to be able to hit the space bar or some key and have him actually jump. So step event of the player, we can use keyboard check release, another function. Again, feel free to look these up but it takes in a key, so vk underscore space, which is our space bar, 
And then inside that if statement, I can set speed. Speed is the opposite of gravity. So I'll set it to the negative value. And you'll see our player, when we hit spacebar, applies that speed variable, flies him up, and then gravity over time slowly pulls him back down, which mimics that jumping motion, which looks great. One final thing here, the road and the trees are not moving very quickly, so it makes it a little bit tough to jump over the trees. I'm just going to go into both the tree and the road and again increase that speed that it's moving to the left. So both of those I'm going to do minus 10 instead of minus 4. Everything's going much quicker now. Gives a little bit better chance to actually jump over these things. And it's looking pretty good. At this point, you've built a complete game, but you've probably just followed my instructions. So it's time to get creative. Try to add your own features. Maybe go and put in a score tracker the way the original game has, or add in a game over when you actually hit a tree instead of just the window closing. You could add floating clouds in the background like the original game has. You could add in audio and sound effects. Check out the audio section of the manual, or you could get really creative and add things like maybe shooting. Maybe you can shoot the trees instead of just jumping over them. Or maybe you can add like a shield type of effect like there is in uh, Super Smash Brothers. And it would block you and prevent the trees from hurting you. To learn in the long run, you're gonna have to just practice and practice and try these little exercises and do these things on your own. Post what you come up with in the comments. I'd love to see them. If you want another tutorial to check out, take a look at the tower defense series that I'm working on. There's a few videos out already. Otherwise, best of luck coding. Bye-bye.